Hey there everyone, today we're going to be continuing our Thomas Pynchon Secondary Literature Review series, this time looking at Joshua Peterson's The Gospel of Thomas Pynchon, Abandoning Eschatology in Gravity's Rainbow. And he's doing a really interesting thing here where he's linking Thomas Pynchon to the Gospel of Thomas. And this is not an entirely spurious or flippant connection. There is a fake Gospel of Thomas quote in Gravity's Rainbow on page 537, which says, Dear Mom, I put a couple people in hell today. Fragment thought to be from the Gospel of Thomas, Oxyrhynchus Papyrus number classified. And from here, Peterson actually makes a quite interesting connection between the content and message of the Gospel of Thomas to that of Pynchon, particularly arguing that both of these texts wish to abandon eschatology, which is this basically logical study of the end times. It's this notion that history is going to unfold into this apocalyptic outcome, which is going to you know, signal the ushering in of the kingdom of heaven, but also it's going to go along with all those sort of prophecy stuff you get in, like, Revelation, the last book of the Bible. Now, Peterson opens by stating that to read Gravity's Rainbow as advocating against eschatology is also to read against the critical consensus, which by and large takes the novel's eschatological parodies at face value. Louis Mackey best exemplifies this critical trend when he suggests that in the novel, all men are either elect, the handful chosen for salvation, or preterite, passed over and tacitly consigned to damnation. In fact, the converse is true. Pynchon mentions these categories only to confuse and confute them, moving his novel's focus away from end times, soteriological destinations, and toward the sacredness of the present creation and the blessedness of all its inhabitants. And I think that's a really crucial point to make because one of the facets of postmodernism that makes it so well known is at the very least, it's distrust of grand historical narratives. Pynchon brings up this elect preterite theme, which comes from Calvinism. And you can see some of my earlier lectures in this series in which we discussed this theme of the elect and preterite. But I think the point here is to set up this contestable zone of, as Homi Baba would put it, hybridity between the elect and preterite. And Pension is always going to give us hope for hope, but oftentimes that is going to be at the very least severely problematized. Peterson writes that Pynchon problematizes the distinction between the two groups, complicating any judgment his reader might make about who is in and who is out of any kingdom to come. And this is going to come with any epistemological questioning is, okay, even if there is an electoral preterite, how do you know who is in and who's not? Peterson says that he questions, criticizes, and sometimes overtly mocks the brand of apocalyptic thinking obsessed with mass death, all the while belittling end-time scenarios concerned with hastening the end of the world. And of course, he kind of embodies this in the Nazis, in characters like Blissrow slash Weissman, for example, who are really the only people to see their their hopeful visions come to fruition, but it's a cynical vision which results in, you know, the transcendence of the rocket immediately turning around at the Brennschluss point, the apex of its arc when its engine cuts off. Now all the power has gone away and it comes right back down and annihilates us. Peterson says that finally he parodies the notion of mystical ascent, a process that one might understand as the individual's effort to get a sneak preview of the eschaton. And just as in the Gospel of Thomas, we're going to be stressing the holiness of this present world. And I just did a lecture recently on the Gospel of Thomas. You might want to go take a look at it to get some more detailed 
um, understandings of what's going on there. But there really is, I mean, there's almost a collapsing of this heaven and hell binary or even a tertiary structure with the earth in the middle of these. Instead, it all kind of collapses together such that there's really an imminent divine potential bred into humans and the earth itself. And through a communion of all these, bringing them into oneness through gnosis, through, um, through knowledge, we get a, a realization of the kingdom of heaven as being here. And when discussing what the actual content of the Gospel of Thomas is, Peterson mentions that this was discovery, discovered um, with the Nag Hammadi texts and it became available to the broader public in the 1950s and 60s. And one of the things that sets it apart is, of course, it's not a narrative like any of the other canonical Gospels, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Instead, it's a series of proverbs, parables, prophecies, and rules for the community. And this has a lot of parallels in the structure of Gravity's Rainbow, because, for example, when I think of proverbs, I think of these proverbs for paranoids, which um, may be kind of riffing on the theme of proverbs, but of course they're quite um, cynical. They're about this um, having sex with the rocket. Uh, and in terms of prophecies, I mean, prophecies abound in Gravity's Rainbow, but note the cynicism that underlies all of them. You have the Raketenstadt, which is the the rocket city. And of course, this is a, um, a cynical vision not of a future city, but of the current cities. If you notice throughout, there's a kind of mapping and understanding of the city as being this uh, phallic landscape of chimneys and stuff sticking up like uh, like what the, the rainbow cock of the earth, as it said at one point in Gravity's Rainbow. There's this understanding that this Raketenstadt is imminent to the current conditions of the world, just as the Gospel of Thomas sees heaven bred within these imminent conditions. So maybe there is a bit of cynicism um, such that gravity's rainbow is sort of reverting or reversing the Gospel of Thomas. The other prophecies are the salvation brought on by the V2, which is motivating characters like Blissero to put Gottfried inside of the V2 and kind of actualize this perverse vision for, you know, Gottfried means God and peace, and it's kind of being co-opted in this rocket prophecy, which is in fact a imminent vision of destruction. Um, one of the prophecies that really hinges on the religious is the Kyrgyz light which is this mysterious phenomenon that Chicherin, the Soviet officer, tries to seek out, but of course he can't reach it. So these prophecies are always um, either held out as something we can't reach, or they are something we have already reached, in a sense, with our intimacy with technology. And when it comes to understanding the Gospel of Thomas in some more detail, he mentions the relation between the Gospel of Thomas and the Q source. This is from um, the German Quell for source, or Quelle for source. And this is the hypothetical source that Matthew and Luke, if you, if you look at these two Gospels, they share a lot of uh, verbatim passages and similar sentiments such that most biblical scholars are pretty confident that these sources share a hypothetical previous source that they both had, and there has been some scholarship that has shown that the Gospel of Thomas is probably very similar to this Q source and may have been another source for other Gospels. And he mentions that Coaster, for instance, believes that while Q concerns itself with the development of an eschatological history, Thomas that being the Gospel of Thomas. And anytime I mention Thomas, it's going to be the Gospel of Thomas. Anytime I mention Pynchon, it's going to be Thomas Pynchon. Thomas speaks of the attainment of this worldly wisdom that provides knowledge of the self. Quote, and this is from Robinson, whereas Q emphasized the eschatological expectation of the future coming of the kingdom of God, the Gospel of Thomas, in its oldest form, stressed the finding of wisdom or of the kingdom of the Father in the knowledge 
hypnosis of oneself, guided by the sayings of Jesus, end quote. So contra Q, the Gospel of Thomas embeds the self in the created world and suggests that it might come to meaningful fulfillment, not in some future heaven, but here on this earth. And once again, Pynchon is going to reverse this because we see um, the dissimulation of the self through an intimacy with the zone, an intimacy with the world shows that ourselves have been something constructed, that the motives of the characters, for example, Slothrop's motive to engage in this uh, sort of quest motif of finding the mysterious link between his past conditioning when he was a child and the current link between his erections and V2 rocket strikes, this gets perverted and eventually he realizes that his self must fragment at the understanding that his self may not have actually been a coherent entity to begin with. Peterson continues that in Davies's view, the author of Thomas does not by and large concern himself with eschatological notions insofar as he believes that the kingdom of God has already begun here on earth. Therefore, the realization of the divine presence is only a question of perception, To bring about God's kingdom, one needs only to recognize it, the acquisition of gnosis. And this is one of the points that I think really we can see in Pynchon is this perspectival approach in which, I mean, even in this Gnostic understanding, it's only a question of changing one's mental state, of becoming aware of certain knowledge. Uh, It's almost idealist in in its essence to actually see a change, an imminent bringing about of the kingdom of God. And this brings us to the elect and preterite theme, which we see in the Gospel of Thomas, but it's often, instead of being this bifurcated, uh, you know, binaristic opposition, it becomes unitary. They become collapsed categories. They become undifferentiated, such that you have the sheep and goat theme is one that you uh, see in the other Gospels a lot. And you'll see, for example, these visions of Jesus is going to take some of the sheep and um, put him on his left side and some on his right side, and to one side he will say, you know, welcome to the kingdom of heaven, and to the others he will say, I never knew you. And of course the question for Christians is, how do you know the difference? How do you make sure that you're uh, in the right one, not in the wrong one? Peterson writes that Thomas levels the playing field, suggesting that everyone has the potential to become one of God's elect largely because everyone always and already dwells in the divine kingdom, that being this earth. Thomas as Jesus utters a similar dictum as in Matthew, so the last will be first and the first will be last, saying, for many who are first will become last, but he adds a significant qualifier, and they will become one and the same. The imagery here does not invert, instead it levels out. Jesus puts everyone on the same plane and renders first and last, high and low, identical. Indeed, he seems to condemn the very act of differentiation. At one point, he provokes his disciples by saying, I'm not a divider, am I? And I think this is really interesting because Pynchon is trying to struggle with how can we respect individual identities and differences? How can they keep themselves from being collapsed into this unitary homogenous system that is governed by them. And I think you can see the sinister undertones that Pynchon sees in the Gospel of Thomas, which is that this vision of the leveling out of, of high and low is a bit sinister. Even in the other Gospels, you see that For example, when it mentions the collapsing of um, master and slave, and maybe this is actually in Paul's letters, um, the the difference is done away with because everyone is a slave of God. So there's a universal state of slavery or preterition such that everyone becomes subject to this integration, conformity, a radical egalitarianism and oneness, but with quite sinister implications. And I think Pynchon realizes that this can be brought into a technological context 
to lead us to really become beholden to these narratives of, you know, the superior eschatological bringing forth of this Reichenstadt, of this future kingdom which has sinister complications. And one of the problems, of course, is that it's impossible to locate or redeem this, this, this place, this present, this future. Peterson writes, A certain social gravity pulls all of these characters down to the same plane, just as all the rockets, thrust so high into the air, plummet inexorably back to the ground. This social leveling has an analog in the theory of entropy, a concept that interests Pynchon throughout his writings. Entropy is the tendency of all closed systems to revert to low energy states. And you can see my first lecture in this series for more details on entropy. The book's opening passage describes a wartime evacuation in entropic terms. Refugees, forced from their homes by a bombing threat, stream out of the city into the harsh countryside, and their movement represents an effort by the system to, quote, try to bring events to absolute zero, the ultimate low-energy state. You might see this as diffusion across a membrane to uh, equalize this concentration of particles and atoms. But if, in physical systems, the return to absolute zero is undesirable in social terms, it is tantamount to salvation. Pynchon describes the harassed masses streaming out of the city in such terms. Quote, drunks, old veterans still in shock from ordnance 20 years obsolete, hustlers in city clothes, derelicts, exhausted women with more children than it seems should belong to anyone, stacked about among the rest of the things to be carried out to salvation. Throughout Gravity's Rainbow, Pynchon's preference, like that of Jesus, is for these lost souls closest to the bottom line and surest to return to it. For gamblers and hobos, prostitutes and souses, single mothers and molested children. And, of course, Jesus is going to these people because this is who he wants to tell about the kingdom of God. These are the meek and mild who deserve it. But for Pynchon, these meek and mild are just the sort of last refuge for a dying world. It's a lot more cynical you know, cynical. It doesn't have this possibility for some grand scheme of hope, per se. Peterson continues that Pynchon suggests that preterition can be a precious blessing. For while being passed over in God's divine plan for the world as a bane, being passed over by the rockets that define the parabolas of gravity's rainbow is to be very literally both preterite and holy. Enzian gives Slothrop a mantra that helps describe the benefits of preterition. Quote, we have a word that we whisper, a mantra for times that threaten to be bad. Mbakayere. You may find that it will work for you. Mbakayere. It means I am passed over. End quote. Facing the many new terrors of the 20th century, sometimes one may only pray to be spared from destruction, in which case being passed over means, ironically, being saved, becoming a member of the elect. And I think that's a really genius reversal which Peterson is really able to bring out. There is a subtle distinction here, and oftentimes it just depends on context or perspective. And yet, Peterson brings out some of the ways in which the Gospel of Thomas may be mirroring what Thomas Pynchon has to say, writing that in this preference for the preterite, Pynchon again follows Thomas. The 42nd saying of the Gospel is as brief as it is enigmatic. Be passers-by, says Jesus to his disciples. One need only recall the meaning of the Latin root for preterite, to pass by or pass over to connect Jesus' command to Enzian's mantra. Enzian offers Slother up a prayer that pleads for respite, let me be passed over. Jesus, switching to the active form, asks his followers that they themselves pass over. In the language of gravity's rainbow, to pass over is to hold back one's destructive force, or perhaps more generally to show mercy. 
For Pynchon, the ethic of mercy is integral to the Slothropite heresy, the blessedness of the other communicated by William Slothrop's On Preterition. And I must just add something here, and maybe Peterson wasn't thinking about this, but one of the other implications of passing over, of actively being a passer over, is a sort of notion of surveillance or control. And Pynchon is always critical of this because the very act of being able to control a perspective, of being able to choose to pass over others, is often the very beginning, the exigence of future atrocities to come. The ability to rule over information and perspectives that which result from that information is going to have with it really how it is decided who is elect versus preterite. So maybe there is a little bit of um, irony or cynicism in there as well. But Peterson continues, as the narrator wonders, suppose the Slothropite heresy had had the time to consolidate and prosper. Might there have been fewer crimes in the name of Jesus and more mercy in the name of Judas Iscariot? It seems to Tyron Slothrop that there might be a route back. End quote. That route back leads to the reestablishment of a universal preterite community based on an ethic of mercy in which all come together in compassion for the other who is also oneself. And this is where, again, I, I must bring in the potential on which this may be taking Pynchon a little bit too far. Now, granted, he does understand this ethic of mercy as being very important, but the notion that this is going to create some coherent community is not really what Pynchon has in mind because even that is a little bit, I don't know, it's got a, a tinge of a grand narrative because Pynchon is just seeing these people as holding out. This is just a temporary strategy to keep people kind of uh, focused on a world, kind of keyed in to a last place of respite. Peterson continues, Like Thomas's Jesus, Pynchon seems unwilling to be a divider, to let the distinction between preter and elect stop him bringing everyone together in community. The last words of his novel, Now Everybody, call all to join in William Slothrop's preterite chorus. To use Bachten's term, Pynchon's guiding tendency is degradation. He unites all of his characters beneath the surface of the preterite's rolling waves. And eschewing such ultimately soteriological distinctions, Pynchon challenges eschatological readings of his novel. When one cannot tell who is a sheep and who is a goat, one cannot make the divisions necessary to bring about such a Matthian apocalypse. And that's definitely important because this does lead to a renegotiation of where hope lies. For Pynchon, it is not in the hierarchical, in the systematic, in the, in the high perspective at the very least. If anything, it's in the low perspective. And even in the low preterite perspective, it's only hope insofar as it is a coping mechanism. But there is always, and I see this a lot more um, in Mason and Dixon, this hope of something mystical, just a glimpse of the sublime, perhaps. As Peterson writes, for Thomas, God is imminent, and his divinity is present not only in a natural creation, but in each individual human being. Jesus gently chastises those who seek for the kingdom of God elsewhere. Quote, if those who lead you say to you, see the kingdom is in the sky, then the birds of the sky will precede you. If they say to you, it is in the sea, then the fish will precede you. Rather, the kingdom is inside of you and it is outside of you. End quote. The work of salvation and the recognition of the imminence of the kingdom are the same. Thus, once one comes to recognize the divinity within, one will also have achieved the kingdom. Davies suggests that the kingdom of God is a matter of correct self-perception. Quote, when people actualize their inherent ability to perceive through primordial light, he says, they perceive the world to be the kingdom of God. 
Davies simply follows Thomas's Jesus, who commands, quote, recognize what is in your sight, and that which is hidden from you will become plain to you, end quote. And this leads one to wonder, okay, where is the mystical? I mean, if you look, for example, at the Kirgiz light theme that I mentioned, well, that's something fleeting even for those who can see or can locate it. And for Chitrin, it's entirely an impossibility. And we see this when we're talking about the dodos being extinct. Peterson writes that for Pynchon, as for the author of Thomas, there is no heaven, no distinct divine realm or distant divine realm where peace is found. Truth, freedom, and knowledge are to be sought here on earth. Pynchon, like Thomas's Jesus, also derides those who would focus on bringing about a new world by apocalyptic means. In fact, he ruthlessly parodies those who wish to end this world in brutal Calvinist fashion, and hence the the uh, focusing on the dodos going extinct and the very Nazi mission itself. Their destruction only proves the ghastliness of Franz van der Grove's religious barbarism, because Franz van der Grove is a Dutchman, who is trying to bring about this, this kingdom. Peterson says, but perhaps more ridiculous than Franz's crusade against the dodos is his drunken wish to convert them, to co-opt them into, quote, what their round and flaxen invaders were calling salvation. In one of the novel's funniest passages, Pynchon describes Franz's dream of the dodos as mass conversion. Quote, ranked in thousands on the shore with a luminous profile of reef on the water behind them. They have come from their nests and rookeries to be sanctified, taken in. And there are tears of happiness in the eyes of the dodos. They are all brothers now, they and the humans who used to hunt them, brothers in Christ. Franz, blinded by his religion, does not realize that he need not convert the dodos to save them. He only needs to stop shooting them. The extent to which individuals will go to map their apocalyptic visions onto the world is laughable. It does not take much to realize just who the dodo is in the inane eschatological fantasy. And that's exactly true, because I think Pynchon is really showing the ways in which we rationalize atrocities, right? He's trying to get us in the mind of the German in the 30s and 40s, and even before the 30s and 40s, who is able to rationalize building the V-2 rocket, being aware of their complicity in a project to construct this rocket through the underground slave labor camps at Nordhausen, at Mittelbau Dora, all of these places in which atrocities are being committed, and yet you can have this grand eschatological vision that justifies it in such a way where you, you're ushering in a kingdom where uh, one day they'll thank you, so to speak. Maybe that's not exactly what the Nazis would have said. They probably didn't really care for the Jesus' thanks, but uh, nevertheless, I, I think the point remains. Now, after discussing the ways in which uh, Kabbalistic-style mythical transcendence and all of these various uh, graspings towards the spiritual or the esoteric, how these all fail, he says that, but for Pynchon, degradation, again, in the Bakhtinian sense of the term, is where all true spiritual quests should end, because the earth in which we all are eventually buried is perhaps the holiest of materials. The fecal matter that pudding ingests is a metonym for dirt, mud, and earth, and the buried, sacred, and his attempt at mysticism may be the most genuine that Pynchon provides. In fact, Pynchon indicates that our salvation is below the ground, and the enlightenment is ironically interred. Gravity pulls us not to the earth's surface, but through it, down into a black paradise. Gravity, says Pynchon, is really something eerie, messianic, extrasensory in Earth's mind-body. Having hugged to its holy center the wastes of dead species gathered, packed, transmuted, realigned, and woven. 
He goes on to suggest that all who live on earth are not chosen for enlightenment, left on the outside of the earth at the mercy of a gravity we have only begun to learn how to detect and measure. And we can merely wait until the final degradation of earth, the ultimate gravitational pull, delivers us to final preterition beneath. So you can see the bastardization that Pynchon is doing of eschatological visions themselves, in which we're not trying to evangelize, which is kind of a, a, a pseudonym for these general grand narratives which require imperialistic expansion and things like that. No, it's these very local, you know, in the in the style of the counterculture of his time, of the 60s and 70s especially in America, you're trying to do anarchistic, non-hierarchical sort of individual exercises in things like um, hope and grace and mercy and things like that. Now, Peterson says that for Thomas Pynchon, as for Thomas, his evangelist twin, the spiritual is to be found here on this present earth, not in a future eschaton or in a far-off heaven. Until we can finally delve beneath its surface to a buried sacred, the supernatural divine is imminent in the created world. The rainbow's very sexualized communion with the earth coincides with his own oneness with the horizontal, with vectors that stretch out to the horizon. For Pynchon, true spirituality is found not in the vertical. Gravity hinders our attempts at mystical ascent and pulls down our prayers like plummeting rockets. As in Georges Bataille's theory of religion, the spiritual is found in this blessed horizontal, in the zigzagging across the liminal space of the zone where God may be found, as in Thomas, in tree and rock. And I think that's very interesting, thinking about the dimensionality of gravity's rainbow, of, you know, we don't have the omniscient narrator perspective, which would usually give us that vertical dimension where we have the very clear down low of the text, of the dirt of the text, and then we have the kind of bird's eye view from the narrator who knows everything. No, instead it's all kind of this, I'm, I'm thinking about the plane of eminence of the Lozengutari. You can see some of my lectures on such a subject, and maybe that will help in the hermeneutical approach to gravity's rainbow. But all of the elements are imminent here, and we don't get a transcendent perspective that we can use to determine the contents below. Everything is self-reflexively and recursively involved in itself and the other members around it, and we don't get this vertical, eschatological way out. As Peterson says, Pynchon's appropriation of Thomas's gnosis ultimately emphasizes the parodic aspect of all of these quests, all of which end in ambivalent failure. And Pynchon's message is both simple and for anybody who might listen. Our heart's desire is not to be found on some wild quest for external truth, but in our own backyard. So that being said, I hope this has been helpful, given you some food for thought in understanding Pynchon. Check out any of my other lectures in this series for more detail on certain of these points that I discussed here, as well as other very nuanced and new ones. You can see any of my lectures that I've done on postmodernism, German idealism, gender theory, postcolonial studies, and other classic literature. You can become a channel member for $5 a month and gain access to, among other things, a monthly private philosophy Zoom, which I do the second Sunday of every month at 2 p.m. Central. I also have super thanks if you'd just like to donate to the channel, because I'd appreciate anything you have to give. It helps me out, but also no pressure. That being said, that's it for this lecture, and I will see you in another one. <laughs>